Uh, hello, welcome to the first afternoon session. My name is Cornelia Metzig from Queen Mary University of London. I'm the chair for this session. And we welcome our first speaker, Shera Troma from University of Huddersfield, who speaks on flexible visualization of sound collections. Thank you. Um, so, hi, so I just would like to mention that because it's a talk format, um, I think my name, but this is a lot of this is uh, in collaboration with Owen Green here and Pierre saint um within the Fluid Corporate Manipulation Project. It's a research project we all work in. Um, so, I would like to start with samplers, just for the younger folk in the room. These were like uh, computers that we, that we used to make music with recordings, right? We may all have forgotten about this, but they, they, were, they had like a specialized interface and they were kind of two schools. One more about <clears throat> playing notes and caring about the envelope and the looping point and so on, like replacing a synthesizer. And then there was the kind of MPC school, more for like between the music and mixing sounds and stuff like that. And as uh, general purpose computers started to be more uh, ubiquitous and, and available, a lot of people just replace the samples with computers, but it's quite surprising, a bit like in the rest of music technology, how these interfaces keep living and shaping the, the more popular paradigm still today, right? So one would think that a general purpose computer like this has a large screen and a lot of storage space, so we could use that um, to create better interfaces for, for uh, playing with music collections, right? And so that's a bit of the justification for visualizing collections. And of course, there's been a lot of work um, in the academia, in both in, in music information retrieval, uh, for trying to find metaphors to show like music collections in, in visual displays. And particularly in music creation, this kind of, this program called CatArt has been very influential in showing how one can use the scatter plot as an interface for, in this case, for kind of granular based uh, music creation. But um, we could focus on things presented uh, at this conference. So the first year I presented this one, and it was a kind of uh, interface for querying uh, this database for free sound for things that kind of are like loops and it could be played at kind of a similar tempo. So you would get like a few dozen samples that you could play together. And this was, um, they were displayed on a two dimensional plane using a, a very popular library called D3 that hopefully some of you know. Um, using a force layout algorithm that I will just describe. Um, and a couple of years later, um, there was another project that uh, my former colleagues, Frederick Fon and, and Jesus and Dea presented, also making a query to Freesound and then displaying the results using a more popular and trendy algorithm called uh, TD Distributed Stochastic Network Embedding, short uh, Disney. And yeah, they, they also had lots of stuff to play with the samples and so on. Then two years later, actually this morning, while I was finishing my presentation, um, another one was presented. So I thought it would be funny to mention because it was the same kind of thing. It was a, also a Disney kind of visualization. Of course, Jason said they're not using this for the recommendation, but still, um, it's, it shows that there's interest in this kind of um, stuff for web audio. So, um, sorry. I think it would be worth stopping and, and describing a bit how these things work. So basically we take sounds, make like a, an analysis, a, a spectral analysis of frame by frame, and then we obtain like a time series of, for each frame of a descriptor of some, some thing that is perceptually relevant, or maybe not very perceptually relevant, but some descriptor of, of the sound. And then we aggregate this, we make some statistics, and we obtain like a vector a representation of a sound, and that actually gives us a high dimensional feature space for all the sounds in a collection. So this is like a two dimensional space, but with many dimensions, it's not very intuitive. So basically, it's quite common in machine learning and data analysis to use this kind of dimensionality reduction algorithms that project this high dimensional space into dimensions of three um, for visualization, for example. And the more classic algorithms, they try to preserve. Um, the structure of this high dimensional space and the distances in uh, the low dimensional space. So things that should be far apart in the original space have to be far apart in the projected space. Um, but more recently, maybe as, as we increase the number of dimensions, actually, it's more and more difficult to make sense of very high dimensional spaces. 
the algorithms that are really more popular actually just care about local neighborhoods. So they try to um, find places where one object is very close to other objects and actually project those into low dimensional space. And that is typically used, uh, done using a, what's called the K nearest neighbor graph, which means that we take, uh, in this case, the sound. We look, uh, because we have this um, vector, we can compute distances. We can compute the K, for example, 15 nearest neighbors. We make connections and we create a graph, a network in this way. And then actually, it turns out that there are already a lot of algorithms for um, visualizing graphs that exist uh, for, for graph layout algorithms. Most of them are based on uh, simulations of forces. So they will look at a sound, uh, or an object, a node in this network as a, as a mass. And there will be like a re repulsion force between all of them. And then the connections will be like attraction forces. And you will run a simulation that eventually when it becomes stable, the sounds or the objects that are connected, they are close together. And the ones that are not connected are not close together. And it turns out that most of the dimensionality reduction, more like machine learning based dimensionality reduction algorithms, uh, also use this kind of paradigm with more like mathematical intuition about, about the distances in the spaces, but actually the same kind of uh, mechanics. So um, this is a bit of a diversion. But we did this work, uh, this, we presented this this summer at the NIME conference where we wanted to compare some of these algorithms for kind of music creation applications. And it's quite hard to compare because they all, I mean, it's very subjective. So, for example, if we plot like a collection of drum sounds, of course, the drums, they all have like natural clusters, the, the bass drums, something, and the snare drums. Uh, so you can see if, the, if these clusters appear in these visualizations, it's not the only one, but it's one of these features that these algorithms provide. And we kind of concluded that um, the older, like PCA, MDS, these are the algorithms that try to preserve the global space. The less interesting, but actually all the others, they all had some kind of interesting affordances for, for music. And uh, from then on, the, the interest was more in the, in the other aspects, so just what parameters they have, how can we uh, tweak them to create different shapes, and how fast they are. Um, so, change of subject, then um, all, these, all these things mm, allow you to create scatter plots. But um, you, could, you may want us also to, to represent sounds as something else than a point, right? So, this is another project we presented last year at the Web Conference. It was a library for visualizing the sounds themselves. So, using the descriptors to um, the text of a descriptor to represent and to play with different colors and shapes. And this is a very flexible library that allows you to to combine the scriptures to create um, some visual representation of one sound. So the contribution of this talk is how can we put uh, both things together? And so the idea is that um, yeah, we have the frame level kind of time series uh, descriptors that uh, we can use to represent the sounds. And then we can use the statistics we compute to represent the layout. Um, and Part of this is one, like offline, it's, it's a bit of a negotiation, what, what can you do in the browser, because many of these steps are expensive. And also we have like an optional step where you can actually take a long recording and convert it into a, segment it into a collection, um, and then do all of this. And then the main challenges here are, um, well, you can see in the previous projects, for example, this one, Yes, it was using a force layout with some repulsion force, but still there's no guarantee that there's no overlap. So, um, and of course, if you use something like Disney, there's even less guarantee that there's no overlap. So how can we mm, avoid these overlaps? Then even if we want to use different sizes for the sounds, for example, to represent duration or loudness with different sizes, and even different shapes. So for example, if we want to represent duration as horizontal size, then we'll have rectangles of different shapes. And the algorithms don't like this very much. So I'll just describe three, uh, three algorithms that are available for JavaScript that we can use for these kind of things. The first one is called constraints-based layout. So on paper, it looks like exactly what we need. Um, it adds the non-overlapping as explicit constraints. So it's, not, it's no longer a desirable thing, it's actually enforced. And then it tries, uh, within this constraint, to preserve the original topology of the graph. 
Turns out the topology of the graph is not something that we're super interested about. We only use the, the nearest neighbor's graph as a, as a means to obtain this kind of clustering and similarity, but actually it's the closeness that we're interested about, not the graph itself. So sometimes trying to optimize the shape of the graph uh, leads to results that are not so interesting. Uh, another one that is the current, like, officially trendy one, is called UMAP, um, Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection, it's based on quite uh, heavy mathematics uh, called uh, topological data analysis. But basically, it ends up being yet another um, force-based layout algorithm with better mathematical uh, intuitions. And then, um, Interesting aspect is quite fast, and then it has at least this min minimal distance parameter that allows you to define the minimum distance between points in the final layout, which means if we don't do different shapes, if we don't do different sizes, we can still um, prevent the overlaps. And then finally, uh, this D3 library in the version 4, they introduced a more um, elaborate uh, force directed layout, which is almost like a game engine. It's like a uh, quite interesting physical simulation. That the most interesting part is that it has like a very modular interface, so you can plug and play different forces and create your own layout and by choosing different forces. And you can even write your own forces, um, although I, I still haven't had any success with that. So, yeah, hopefully we still have some time for a demo, and this, of course, is very risky, but we'll try. If the demo doesn't work, I, I have some screenshots. So here I have um, a drum, a collection of drums, um, where the color is a spectrum choice, so it represents, so the red things are um, bass drums, and the more like green things, I think they are uh, different rides and hi-hats. So, sorry, it's a little bit, is it okay? Um, so yeah, you can uh, you can see that this is using the D3 for layout. So you can see this quite clear clusters um, of similar sounds, um, and still kind of good at the overlap. It's not perfect. There's still some, uh, but but it's quite good. Most of the time they don't overlap. This is this a force about, that gets about collisions. So by using this collision force, we can avoid uh, overlaps. And that would have to be demo that. I end up losing the selector in the other um, side with this nice zoom interface. So I'll drop it and compute another one. But it takes a couple of minutes. So the constraint space layout is a lot slower. And as you will see, it yes, it, it, it's perfect in terms of overlap, but actually it ends up creating a more regular grid. Um, that loses a bit the, the, the original cluster. So you don't, you still see areas of similarity, but, um, but I, I personally feel that I lose a bit by this kind of regular spreading of the sounds. Um, it's not so clearly clustered. And then two minutes, finally, um, the UMAP one is it's kind of faster. Um, and it's, it's very good, I think, in terms of uh, both the clustering and the kind of uh, compactness. That's another parameter that it's sometimes interesting to, to optimize the, the use of the space. Um, so it's, it's a very good compromise in, in terms of the clustering and the use of space. But of course, in this case, I'm using the size to represent duration. So it doesn't, you might doesn't guarantee um, that they don't overlap in this case. Um, so to conclude, um, this is still work in progress, but so far I'm finding that um, the first, the old, good old, you know, force like layout in D3 is still quite a good compromise. Um, and there's still some challenges. For example, the choice of descriptors is still is a very like um, it's fairly tricky thing. But you have to choose descriptors for the layout, descriptors for uh, the sounds. And they must be I mean, intuitive and at the same time good for um, representing the structure. And then, as you may have seen, uh, uh, the louder sounds and the quieter sounds 
they, they're not very well differentiated. And this is because, actually, for example, these ones, and these ones, I mean, well, it's not very clear, but actually, I found some cases where there was some big white ones that looked very big, and that's because the scaling actually is normalized for each of the rectangles. Like we should look into the, the general distribution of the loudness, for example, of the energy in this case, and scale each one according to the, to, the, to the rest, instead of each one individually. So that's still something to do. And then, yeah, so hopefully combining some of the strengths of these algorithms, we can, we can obtain uh, the best possible um, layouts. And that's all, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Jared, um, are there any questions? Can we see it online? Not at the moment. But um, as I said, it's work in progress, so there will be, there will be something, perhaps more than online, something that people can use, basically. Other question? Sorry. Sorry, okay. Uh, for those audio spectrograms, those tiny preview images, did you also use D3 to calculate them or are they just uh, static no. images? So, so this actually this is available. This is the library we presented last year. Okay. That allows you to compute this, um, these images. It doesn't include the feature extraction. And for feature extraction, I think one of these days, uh, Luis is going to present uh, very good library for that, so I think the connection between two will give you a lot okay. of stuff to play with. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, one more question. Um, it's, it's fascinating work, thank you. Um, are you also looking then at ways of um, selecting sequences of sound, for instance, or, uh, you know, like in cat art where you might um, set up collections that you're performing back? Like, is there a, are you thinking towards a performance interface of some kind? Yes, actually, I'm, I'm uh, playing this evening with something based on this. Um, it's very basic at the moment, but there are some sequencing and stuff going on, and so you can have a chance to see it. I think there's another question over there. Oh. Very, impressive, very impressive work, thank you. Uh, the, so you mentioned in one of the slides that you are actually taking a longer recordings and then cutting them into the parts. And in this case, what was the recordings? Or it's just any kind of arbitrary recording that you can use for that? Or, or you have several samples in one recording? Or what it, what it is, really? Well, this was an optional step, actually. So this is in, uh, we work in a project where we're interested in this kind of uh, collections of sounds. That some of them they, they will be obtained from, from segmenting a, a long recording. But in this case, these demos, it was just a collection of drum sounds. There was no, but it's something, I have a program that can do that and generate this kind of visualization. Just enjoy it. Okay, one and one is one no. Okay, and let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>